Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where you join me at the final checkpoint of our epic hypercar tour here in Croatia. We've been on Supercar Owner's Circle, which has brought us now here to the home of Rimac, where we're about to head indoors for a private tour with Mate Rimac himself to discover the assembly behind these. The near on 2000 horsepower electric hypercar, the Rimac Nevera. We're surrounded in this car park by Bugattis, Paganis, Koenigseggs. We've been driving in my purple Zenvo TSRS that has made it here to our finish line. Mate has been driving in this very Nevera as well. But I think without any further ado, let's head on in to go have a look around the assembly hall, discover more of the process, see some of the development and testing prototype cars as well, plus the finishing areas and plenty more here in this new location that has been developed for the assembly of Novera. Let's head on in, go catch up with Mate and have a look around. Hey Shmi, welcome to the Rimac or Bugatti Rimac headquarters now. Thank you very much, very exciting to be here, very exciting to come and have a look around. Yeah, so this was actually uh, just an abandoned like uh, warehouse or, or shopping center uh, for like do-it-yourself stuff uh, a year ago and we converted it to our temporary facility until the campus is done. The campus is the biggest uh, construction site in the country. It's going to be the biggest production and R&D facility quite in the region. And where we have been before is uh, our old location where we still have lots of stuff ongoing. So now we are scattered around until the campus becomes available, but I'll show you what we have here. So this is the assembly area. Where yeah, here we make the Nevera, but uh, bits and pieces of it are being made in other of our locations as well. But I'll show you what we have here. So here we have one of the first Nevera prototypes. You can see it all beaten up, not very nice looking. We went through three generations of cars, experimental prototypes, validation prototypes, and pre-series, and then series cars. This was part of the experimental prototypes. And from experimental to validation prototypes, we changed everything. And then again, <laughs> for pre-series, because you know I'm never happy. Uh, here is a, a Concept One, one of the Concept One development cars, our first car. We actually showed the first one uh, in 2011 in, uh, at the Frankfurt Auto Show, so already 11 years ago. It's amazing to think you showed your first Concept One 11 years ago and you now have a team of, I believe, approaching 2,000 employees. Yeah, close to 2,000 people now. <laughs> yeah, That's happened crazy. fast. <laughs> when we showed that car, we were like eight people in the company. Wow. Yeah. And wow, here wow. a bit about the other side of the business, uh, battery for the Aston Martin Valkyrie. I can mm -hmm. show you actually where we make it. Battery for the Königsegg Regera. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of stuff that kept us afloat to pay the bills barely as we were still in the early stages of the company. Well, I mean, it's pretty exciting to work with such partners. Uh, well, Koenigsegg, Christian and Poratia were my big heroes. Yeah. You know, the first thing I did when I started a company was to jump in a car and go to Modena to visit uh, Horatio and mm -hmm. tell him about my idea. You know, at that time, Pagani was like a 30, 40 people operation. Yeah. And now, you know, having the two of them as my friends, Yes, and it's really cool. Customers and, you know, at the other side also, you know, I was a car guy all my life and going to Geneva or Frankfurt, you always wonder what's going to be there, what's behind the curtains, you know, what is under the wrap of these prototypes that people catch on Nürburgring and so on. And now being in the position to know exactly what's going to come in three or four years for many of the car companies and helping them to develop and build those cars, that's like, you know, full circle for me. You know, yeah, something it's like the that, dream. Yeah. So here we have, uh, upstairs we have offices. So around 400, 500 people in this office. Uh, so we have various kinds of things here from development, purchasing, project management, all kinds of stuff. In our other two locations is most of the development done. So here's more production. So in the location where you were before, there we are now developing future Bugatti and Rimac cars. Okay. And in another location from here, we are developing batteries and powertrains and that kind of stuff. So here it's more about production. Uh, but as I, as I told you, this is just a temporary solution for us. So we did it quick and dirty. Now maybe something interesting for you. Uh, so our top mantra for the company is transparency. So we want to show everything. Also, you can see on YouTube how we developed the Nevera and all of that is very yeah. transparent available. So there is no walls here. There's glass where we have to have walls. And every room has a name of a fa famous car person. Yeah. So Gordon Murray or over there is Elon Musk, or I don't know, I think uh, we have there Christian Koenigsegg. And I actually forgot that we have that. And when Christian was here for the first time a few weeks ago, we were walking by and he was like, what's this? <laughs> uh, so he saw his so name. He, did, he the... didn't have the meeting in his room. <laughs> No, we didn't, yeah, we should have. Uh, Nico Rosberg, so that's the kind of 
stuff we, we are doing here. And talking Nico, of course, you recently handed over the Nivera to Nico. Yeah, well, you know, uh, if you can choose the first customer of your, or, or, or who you're going to, to deliver the car first, you would probably like somebody who doesn't take the car too hard. Uh, you know, you st while still figuring out stuff. So maybe not a Formula One world champion. Yes, and especially <laughs> Nico, who is like trashing cars like crazy. Uh, but it was great to push the whole team. Like the first car has to be perfect because yeah. that's the guy who is going to push it, you know, yeah. like squeeze everything out of it. So that's, uh, that was great for the whole team to like, you know, guys, no fooling around. The first car yeah. is going to be driven by Formula One world champion. Straight in at the deep end. Yeah. So this is how our offices look like. Uh, lots of guys uh, working on different things. And I, what I love about it is that development or let's say offices are right under the production. So when I need to figure something out, when I need to do something, uh, it's very quickly. So if yep. the production guy has a problem, he comes upstairs, knocks on the door and solve the problem. Asks the right person immediately. Yeah. So he is powertrain development. The guys here are developing stuff like electric motors, gearboxes, inverters, and what all of these guys are actually now doing is developing the hybrid system for next Bugatti, or mm -hmm. for the next Bugattis. So Exciting. You might catch some interesting stuff on screens, <laughs> which we might need to blend out later. <laughs> In our other locations, we are producing molds, uh, machine parts, like metal for the buttons or for the battery pack and mm -hmm. so on, carbon fiber parts. Here we are producing the wiring harness of the Nevera. And actually there is 92 different wiring harnesses in one car. Wow. Uh, all of them are being made here. So both high voltage and low voltage. They look a little bit like, you know, diagrams of the London tube. You know, this perhaps. is fascinating to yeah. see. I have to confess, I've never seen the process behind a wiring harness before. Yeah, it's um, fully And obviously you're making that right here. And this is literally linking together every single node, every single connector, everything. Yeah. And the crazy thing is this is being done like this for low volume hypercars, but exactly the same for high volume cars. Mm -hmm. And a big advantage was during the Ukrainian war now, uh, a lot of wiring harnesses are being produced in Ukraine. Yeah. And a lot of the car companies had to stop production because they couldn't get parts. While we didn't have that problem, we could just continue. House. Yeah, because yeah. it's typically a, an element of the car that would be outsourced. Yes, Price. but this is something that feels all the changes you make. Whenever you make a change in the car, it impacts the wiring harness. Yeah. That's why we do it eternally. Like, you know, the guys who do the wiring harness design, all the electronics development in the car, they, you know, just go a few minutes, talk to the people here, yeah. that no mistake can happen. Because if you have that with a supplier and you have to change all the time, it's a nightmare. Makes sense, makes sense. We also do the upholstery in-house. So we produce uh, most of the carbon fiber and other interior components um, in the company. And then here, the guys do the upholstery, like the steering wheel or the doors or whatever. Uh, of course, I'm encouraging the customers to not take an animal product uh, because uh, I think uh, there's good alternatives out there like Alcantara. Uh, so my cars are usually Alcantara interiors, um, but of course the customers can still choose leather if they want to. Yeah. So everything you know, from stitching, uh, embrossment, all of that stuff is done by our team in-house here. Yeah, dashboard, steering wheel being worked on yeah. at the moment. So in these areas, obviously the wiring harness side of things, the interior, the upholstery, presumably upholstery is, well, the whole interior is for, for the Neveras that are, we're going to be seeing shortly on the line. Yes, so the parts are being prepared here for the different cars. You can see here the specifications. So this is for car number 16, uh, which we'll see downstairs in the assembly line. That's really cool. I mean, keeping everything I guess so close together and as you were saying about the wiring harness if anything needs to be changed or anything like that you have such easy access to it yeah exactly so going from the offices to the production oh wow what a view from up here so we were very limited in what we could do in this facility and we didn't want to completely refurbish it because it's uh, a temporary facility but still you know it's very important for me how the environment is it has to be a nice environment to work in it has to be clean um, it has to be a good place for people to flourish, basically, and to produce the best products. That's why it's very orderly. So what are we looking at? We're looking over, obviously, assembly line starts over in the far corner. Yeah, so it's actually an assembly line. It's not a nest production. So let's say uh, Bugatti or Pagani produce in nest stations. Mm -hmm. So the car is in one spot and the parts come to the car. We have a station 
production, which is basically like higher volume manufacturers, which is more industrial. I don't, I'm not saying any is better or worse, it's just different. So we have opted for this one, uh, where the car goes through four stations, and in each station you do the same thing always, so to get higher quality basically. Yeah, going from the monocoque towards rolling chassis. Yeah. I'm ready to head out with lots of light, very clean, the most hospital-like levels of cleanliness. <laughs> well, Shine, shiny actually, floor. yeah, that's a requirement, especially for the battery production, where you will have to uh, dress up to mm -hmm. get into the battery production because we make batteries for many car companies. Yep. And the requirements there are uh, for the air quality and cleanliness, like for hospitals. Yep. So you have actually probes with like sticky um, surface inside, and you leave it there for a few days. And then uh, the particles are being counted, how many uh, dirt particles are in the air. Okay. And if you are about a certain threshold, you, you have to change something. Fascinating. Yeah. So we shall head down. I think mystery stairways. Actually, as this was a shopping center before, it still says like um, furniture upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, upstairs would be offices, upholstery and wiring harnesses. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. So here we make other bits and pieces. Oh. So for example, um, electronic control units are being assembled here. So different kinds of, I think this is actually the black box of the car. Right. Uh, or here infotainment systems, uh, or here, small baby ECUs mm -hmm. <laughs> or bigger ECUs. Oh, okay. I cannot touch them. So these are, uh, I think there's like 20 ECUs in the car. Yep. And the hardware and software of all of them is made by us. Yep. And also for other cars. So here, for example, this is the infotainment of the Aston Martin Valkyrie. Right, okay. Yeah. So the infotainment is made by us, not just the battery. Interesting. Well, very recently I was taking a seat and playing with the infotainment in a Valkyrie. So yeah. I didn't realize at the time that I was experimenting with your systems. So here this is, yeah, this is a beautiful Aston Martin Valkyrie infotainment system done wow. by these guys here yeah all kinds of different ecus so what you know what i'm really proud of is that we don't just have high vertical integration where we develop and produce most of the stuff for our own cars but also for many other car companies and yeah. in many cases where we cannot say or <laughs> don't yeah. reveal any secrets now yeah <laughs> or yeah even some big stuff like this yeah like, because the nevera has um, autonomous driving capability yeah. we really made our life really difficult Yep. Um, so when you have autonomous driving capability, you have to have brake bar wire and steel bar wire capability, which doesn't mean you are completely mechanically disconnected. So brake, in our case, is completely by wire. Steering still has a connection, but you can steer it by wire, mm -hmm. which means you have to have all the redundancy, all of the systems to make sure that in case something happens, for example, with the power supply, that uh, you, the, the system still continue functioning. So this is, for example, making sure that you have that uh, redundancy of power yep. supply to all the critical systems. Yep. So that's Makes the sense. kind of stuff we do here. But Got to carry around a lot of brains. Yeah. Here we are making chargers. So here you can see the finished charger uh, for the Nevera. I really didn't want to make a charger. I really didn't. Yeah. Uh, I was desperately looking on the market for existing chargers, but there was no 800 volt, 22 kilowatt charger. So you can see we actually machined this out of a block of material. Mm -hmm. And you can see inside how complicated it is. And it probably costs us to make like a small car. Yeah. But there was just in these small volumes, you know, but there was nothing on the market. So but you end up with exactly what you need for your car. That's the, yes. the point behind it. Yes, but that's like a painful part, which there is not much, there's not many points to making it. Like this is a part of it. Like this is the uh, transformer part of the charger, also machined from solid block of aluminum. Yep. Like crazy stuff. But yeah, we are early on the market. It's the first like a hypercar that's like homologated and stuff. So yep. there's not much on the market. And then other stuff is being made here as well. Where's the sound spoon? So uh, this is the power distribution unit in the car that comes on top of the battery that distributes the 1.4 megawatt between all the different parts. And again, it's a small volume production, but still, you know, every part of the process is documented. Uh, every step of the process is documented in the system, every torque, every part. And yeah, this is how it looks like um, at the end, so this comes then in the end on the battery. So this is taking the 1.4 megawatt of the battery and distributing between the different uh, powertrain systems, the charger, the fast charging, and so on. Here's one part we are making that's really key to the performance of the car. It's the rear inverter. So this is a one megawatt inverter. 
also not something necessarily we would like to do, but there was none such thing on the market. So in order to get the performance, we had to develop it ourselves. So it's basically two inverters in one. This is the cooling plate, which cools the two inverters. And on one side, you have the inverter for one motor, and on the other side, the inverter for the other motor and a bunch of control systems. So you can see how that looks like. So basically what it's doing, it's taking the DC power from the battery and converting it to AC power to drive the two rear motors. So you have here a bunch of big switches, which is called IGBTs. You have here capacitors and a lot of control systems and sensors. So that's one of the secret sauce uh, components that enables the performance of the car. Uh, so the inverter is part of the powertrain system and the powertrain system is, part, is basically consisting of an inverter, gearbox and motor. Um, so here's the inverter production and by the way here see some machined parts and so on. So that this is for example being made in our other facility. So when people ask me like how long does it take to make a car, they think how long does it take to assemble it. But that's the easy part for us. Yes, you're yeah. gonna make everything first. You know, for example, the car, and then you have the powertrain system, and then you have the inverter, then you have the piece of the inverter. You know, it's a long chain. Yeah, but well, while we're standing here, we're surrounded by carbon fiber monocoques. Ah, yeah, these are monocoques waiting for the assembly process, uh, or actually first the paint shop, but we'll come to that. This is a rear powertrain, so you recognize the inverter. Uh, the mm -hmm. gearboxes are made here. We have some reworks here, so you can, the, the production line is not active right now. There is a semi-automated production line for the gearboxes. Um, and what we have here is two motors, two gearboxes and two inverters, but integrated. So each motor is 500 kilowatts. So we have one megawatt here. So basically 1,300 horsepower. Mm -hmm. So you connect the battery, cooling and communications, and that's the rear axle. The front axle is completely different. So here you have, for example, the motors on the outside, the gearbox is in the middle. In the front, you have the gearboxes on the outside, the motors in the middle. Yep. And it's just 400 kilowatts in the front. Why? Because when you accelerate with so much force, especially, the car moves the center of gravity to the rear, like a boat, you know, when it yep. glides out. And then the rear tires have a lot more grip than the front tires. And that's why we have so much more power in the rear than in the front. Makes sense. And a much bigger powertrain system in the rear. Yep, yep, makes sense. Yeah. So here's the production line for the gearboxes. So the front and rear gearboxes are being assembled on the same line, but they are completely different. And this is the production line of the cars, but we'll come to that. First, I'll show you uh, where the production line starts. So these are the four stations, but we have station zero where the monocoque is being prepared for assembly. Here we are in what we call zone zero, where yep. we pre-assemble the cars and prepare the monocoques for assembly. Um, it's actually too late, so the guys are already home, so it's a little bit empty. But basically here, the monocoque starts as a bare part without any attachment points other than the ones that are machined into it. So we have 222 aluminum inserts for the precise parts that are all machined on a big CNC machine where precision is really important and for the big stuff. So for example, for the uh, suspension attachment points or for the powertrain attachment points, but there is hundreds of different uh, additional uh, holders and parts uh, like these studs that need to be added on or carbon fiber pieces like this holder for the rear um, cooling system or this one for the pump uh, that are added here. So uh, these are being added here with some jigs and fixtures. And then what happens with the monocoque, it gets the body panels. So each monocoque is being mated with its body panels before it goes to painting. Mm -hmm. And so for example, the door, the bonnet. So this car is now waiting for that. So it gets all the different parts we match that all of them fit so that the fit and finish is right that there is uh, the right gaps and the right flush and then the body parts go to painting uh, the monocoque actually also goes to painting so for example matte or glossy finish inside because you can see the monocoque inside so there's no carpet in the car other than here where your foot are but, but everything else is visible the roof gets painted in the right color and then uh, the body meets the rest of the car uh, at the end of the assembly line. So only on station four, they get reassembled. Here you can see how uh, all of these different pieces are being mounted. So you have uh, different kinds of jigs, like uh, water cut or laser cut aluminum parts that tell you where to place different uh, attachment points. So there's like hundreds of these jigs that we make to make it easier for the guys. Um, 
And also what happens here, that's why we have so many of these paint boots here, four paint boots, because of the gases that happen when you bond stuff. We also bond different carbon components. So our carbon production team makes different carbon parts, but usually you have to get multiple pieces into one. So here, for example, for the side mirror, so the mirror has an inner part, so you can see it here, whoops. So this is actually a machined aluminum part, uh, which holds the motor for the mirror. There is a 3D printed part, this is actually an interesting piece. There is a carbon fiber piece, um, and also this is just a placeholder, but then comes here the injection molded plastic part for the blinker and the camera. So you have to precisely put it all together, and you know, you could do it with a couple of guys with a grinder, but we don't want to do that, we want to do things properly. So uh, there is a jig for everything. So there's hundreds of these jigs, like here this is for another side panel of the car, you know, like rubber pieces putting pressure on the pieces to cure them during the um, bonding process. And we also make these uh, tools on our own in our other facility where we have the machining. Um, so we control the whole process of developing this part, making the tool for the part, making the tool for the assembly of it, bonding, and then painting, whatever needs to happen to it, all the way until it's in the car. So that's what we are quite proud of. And once the car is finished here, it goes then to the production line. So another part that's really important for development is testing. This is one of our testing facilities that's now being built up. Uh, it's totally work in progress. And uh, yeah, that's kind of, you know, you jump out of the plane and you build the parachute as you, as you drop. <laughs> so it's kind of all at the same time, we are in constant construction works. So this, for example, is uh, climatic chambers for testing battery modules. So you make battery modules, you put them inside, then you cycle, you know, 100 degrees, minus 40, 100, minus 40. Then you put it on the vibration table, which is also being installed here next door to shake it properly, like all different kinds of uh, scenarios. You drop it from a, a big height, you connect it at the same time to loads. So you charge, discharge, charge, discharge to simulate like it's in the car. So to make sure it works in the car. You try and do everything you can to break it. Abs absolutely, <laughs> before it gets in the car. That's really yeah. important. So first you try everything in simulations uh, yep. before you build the first piece, because everything you do in reality, it's just such a long process until you get parts, do the tooling, assemble stuff, then something goes wrong. Uh, you, you need uh, equipment for that. And yeah, that's what we are testing here and in our other locations. That's for batteries mostly here next door we have something for powertrain, so mm -hmm. where motors and gearboxes and inverters get tested. So yeah, still a lot of construction work going on. But just to show you how it looks like when you test a one megawatt uh, powertrain system. So this is actually an e-axle test rig. Very much work in progress, so yeah, sorry for that. Being installed as we, as we yeah. visit. Being installed, this is really expensive equipment. It costs like a hypercar. And basically you have here on one side a 500 kilowatt unit to test one, let's say, part of the axle and on the other side. So basically what you do here, you put the axle uh, with the two motors in the middle and the uh, gearboxes and in inverter. You have a high voltage power supply, coolant systems and all of that. And you have the shafts connected to these uh, dynos and you test them. It's like, it's like a roller dyno for a car, but much more precise and much more powerful. And this is for one axle and we are also building one for a full car. And now since Bugatti is also part of the family, we are upgrading it so that you can also run a combustion engine car. Until now it was just for, a, uh, for electric powertrains, yeah. but uh, yeah, we will need to do some emission testing also in the future. <laughs> we have two production lines here basically, with four stations each. On the right hand side, the Nevera production line, and on the left hand side, we make rolling chassis for some other car companies. So the production starts here, with the bare monocoque, which came out of zone zero. After the zone zero, it went into painting. And then here first, the wiring harness gets installed, which is being built upstairs, as we have seen. And some key components like uh, the HVAC unit, which we can see here. Actually, the only part in the whole car that's, let's say, an off the shelf uh, system is the HVAC. So on the Concept One, we did it ourselves, which was a total nightmare to do. I really didn't want to make another HVAC system, just like the charger. Uh, so luckily we are using here a unit from an Audi. Uh, and that's the only piece in the whole car that you can find from another car. 
Wow. Uh, so even like all the you know rubber parts, the ceilings, uh, the the pumps, the fans, all of that is being done only for the Nevera, which is kind of crazy, but we wanted to make it properly. So uh, that's uh, station one, and here we have now the first production cars being assembled, uh, and uh, the first cars have been delivered. So Nico Rosberg's car. This is now, I think, cars uh, seven and eight being assembled. So we can have a good look here at all of the components because they are still exposed before the body comes onto the car. We can see also some components that we saw before. The electronic control units, lots of them around the car. The charger, big part. The inverter, and under the inverter are the motors and the gearboxes for the rear. Um, power distribution units. Uh, DC DC converter, so we have 48 volts and 12 volts. So, what used to be an alternator in a combustion engine car is now the DC DC converter and the NVIDIA supercomputer. And we can see here the monocoque of the car, which is uh, already uh, connected with the suspension and the crash structures. And what's interesting about it is that the rear uh, crash structure is directly mounted to the rear part of the monocoque and the suspension is on the monocoque. And then all the way to the front, it's one piece. It's not a subframe. So usually with a McLaren or with a Bugatti or with a 918, you would have here a cut and then you would have a yeah. separate piece. Here it's all one single piece with the front suspension also on the same piece and then the front crash structure. So only the crash structure in the front and in the rear are aluminum and attached to the monocoque. Everything else is the monocoque. So this gives us huge uh, rigidity. This is the most rigid car ever made, 70,000 newton meters uh, per degree. Like a normal car would be like 15, 20,000 newton meters per degree. And the stiffest car after the Nevera is the Chiron, and uh, that's uh, 50,000 newton meters per degree. Okay. So the battery is really supporting that with additional structure. If you lift the car up, you can see a huge hole where the battery comes. And that's, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have a very stiff battery itself, it would weaken the car. So we have lots of cooling. People think that electric cars don't need cooling, but actually they do. Uh, this is covered now to protect it during assembly, but basically here's the radiator for the front motors. On the other side is the radiator for the front inverters. And in the middle, the big radiator is for the battery pack and actually the signature of everybody working on the car. That's really quite fun. Yeah. So, you, so every car has the signature of everybody who works on it. Yes, exactly. And it's quite a few people as well. Quite a few people, yeah. That kind of detail is something I love. That's really nice. <laughs> yeah, I actually wanted that people actually sign it uh, in the cars, but it was a little bit impractical to get everybody together. <laughs> so we do it now with a sticker. Uh, yeah, so actually what I didn't want to have is pipes running through the car for the cooling systems. So the rear powertrain has its own cooling system. So we have here the radiator for the rear powertrain. So on one side for the inverter, on the other side for the motors. And uh, why it's bigger than the front? First of all, it's more powerful, so it takes more load. But also the front is in the direct airflow. This is not in the airflow. So it's quite difficult to get the yep. air around the car and the right kind of air, like fresh air into the mm -hmm. radiators and not like hot air from the brakes or something like that. Yep. So that's quite tricky. Uh, so that's why the rear is bigger. And we have three voltage ranges in the car. Uh, 700 volts for the powertrain, 48 volts for all the cooling systems. So all the pumps, fans are 48 volts. And we have 12 volts for the infotainment and lights and all the usual stuff. And we can see a very big opening of the door. So it's very big here. And also what you can't see here because the monocoque is protected, but maybe if you remove this. Uh, so the monocoque goes inside. So if you would have the wheel now here, the wheel yeah. would be somewhere like when the door is on, the door goes until here. So this was really tough to make a very narrow a side structure in the car for the side impact as well as for the front impact with a big door opening but it was very important for us to have the um, e egress and ingress very easily that you can get in and out of the car very easy so that structure was really important and plus the separate cooling systems help us to do that because in a car usually the pipes are running on the side here so the sill is not moving out when you open yep. the door let's say with the Bugatti the sill is uh, attached to the car even when you open the door because the pipes are here. Since we have separated cooling systems, you don't have to have pipes running through the car. So you actually, when you open the door, the structure of the car is exposed. So mm -hmm. 
everything in the car is kind of connected. It's kind yeah. of crazy to think that you can have a bigger door, door opening if you have separate cooling systems for the front and rear powertrain. It's kind of simple with hindsight, but when you're working on it at the time and coming up with the, the concept and the idea to do it that way. You know, when people say that a car is uncompromised, that there is no compromise on the car, I don't believe one word because <laughs> everything is a compromise, everything. You have to make so many decisions while making a car. Yeah. Like, you know, but if the mission is clear, then it's very easy. Uh, you know, I, I really like how Ferdinand Pia, you know, the, uh, at that time CEO of Volkswagen said when he took over Bugatti and uh, they started to develop the Veyron, he said, the car has to go 400 kilometers per hour and with your wife to an opera the same day. Yep. It was such a clear message, such a simple message. And everything was uh, directed by that message. So uh, in our case, we wanted to make a car that's both ultra high performance, but also very comfortable, luxurious, has all the features, all the technology, and be very unique and you know, exciting and fun to drive, which is a lot of stuff to package in one car. So that's yeah. why the car turned out to be super complicated. Here you can see some sub-assemblies. Uh, so this is, for example, the uh, roof. Uh, the inner side of the mm -hmm. roof and you can see lots of these cables that are actually connected to cameras because we have uh, actually just here in this area we have i think five cameras one looking at the driver from here one from here and uh, three looking out here and here is the dashboard of the car so this is a really nice configuration uh, oh, wow with anodized uh, black anodized aluminum and red anodized aluminum uh, so you can see the infotainment system here we actually have uh, six screens so the instrument cluster, the passenger screen, uh, the three knobs. This is for starting the car and for turning uh, drive or reverse or parking. Mm -hmm. This is for the performance, so for the torque vectoring and for the modes. So range, comfort, sport, track and drift and custom modes. This is for turning on and off the uh, torque vectoring uh, ESP and so on. And this is for torque distribution, how much power you want to have in the rear and how much in the front. And you see, we developed all of this ourselves. This is basically one mechanical, I would say, piece of art that we machined on, on a, the CNC machines with a computer inside. So this has its own processor, its own custom screen. Uh, and it would be a lot easier to just put it as a function on a, on a touch screen. And you know, we redesigned this a hundred times until the click was really right. Yeah. If you see some earlier videos or remember some earlier cars, this was really horrible. And until you make this stuff work and different temperatures at vibrations and also this is very tricky to make work with a head impact so actually you are firing dummy heads into this it has to break off in a very certain way okay. uh, to homologate but we went through all of this pain because uh, we didn't want just to put something on a touch screen but because these are important vehicle controls we wanted it to be something that you can really feel when you change the mode of the car and the whole car changes we want you to feel like you really did something and not just touch something on a, on a touch screen. And I love that you have these little branded sock protector covers here for the assembly, all the details. And also like the jig for this, you know, you could yeah. put this on the table and assemble the uh, thing on the table. It's a small volume production, so it's fine, but you have stuff underneath and so on. So this is something you can actually rotate. You can turn mm -hmm. around and, um, you know, it's a proper, it's not a proper height for people to work on. It can get dirty or damaged because you put it on a table. So even for the small volume production, we make lots of jigs like this to make sure that uh, the, the conditions for the workers are right and also that the product turns out in the best possible way. Here you can see a little bit of my obsession with jigs and fixtures and stuff like that. So this is like the fixture to mount the rear bonnet. And you could say like for 150 cars, you can just have a few guys, you know, mount the bonnet. but. I want it to be done properly, that it doesn't get damaged and so on. So like the, you mount the bonnet there and then uh, automatically lower it to, to the car. Or uh, yeah, here, for example, this is for the car that's now sitting there in the as assembly station for the rear bumper, a nice carbon fiber piece, um, also made by our guys. And you can see it's an American car uh, by this. So yeah. this is actually, I think, the first uh, car being delivered to the US. That's quite exciting to be sending cars around the world. Yeah. Yeah, crazy, basically, to be in that position right now. But what we need to get to is to ship one car a week. That's the goal. Yeah. So the station should move one day, uh, one car every week. Yeah. That's the goal. And we are getting there. So you, this is the jig for the front uh, bumper. And then you have jigs for all kinds of stuff. This is for the front cooling system. The middle one, you have also a jig for the left uh, cooling system, for the right cooling system. So what we have here 
is the main radiator for the uh, battery. So this is wh what cools the battery when the delta between the maximum battery temperature and exterior temperature is high enough. So when the coolant air, so basically the battery cannot be above 60 degrees. And if it's 40 degrees outside, you don't have enough mm -hmm. delta to cool the battery. So this is used when it's, I don't know, 10 outside or 20. When it's hotter, then that gets shut off and you use um, the air conditioning compressor. And there's two air conditioning compressors, one for the inside of the car, for the cabin, and this is the evaporator for that. And this is the evaporator for cooling the battery. So you have a separate high voltage air conditioning system. If it's too hot, a valve shuts off the uh, flow to the radiator and you cool with the air conditioning because it's too hot outside. And then you have here actuators to uh, actuate the flap for active aerodynamics. So in case the battery does need cooling, which is most of the time, you shut uh, the, um, uh, the airflow uh, to, the, to the radiators, it goes just under the car. So basically you don't then, you have a better uh, aerodynamic coefficient. Yeah. So you don't use this big uh, air intake uh, to waste energy basically. Clever. So even though it's a hypercar and you know, in hypercars traditionally you don't think so much about uh, energy efficiency or fuel consumption because these kind of guys can pay for any kind of fuel consumption. But in electric cars, efficiency equals range. That's yep. why you pay attention to it. Which has an even higher premium. Absolutely. So after the cars are assembled here, so in the station four, what's missing in these cars that you see here is the body panels coming on it. But basically then the cars goes to the quality area. And there we have a 3000 horsepower dyno. Okay. Uh, so the car is being fully tested there. Um, we have a monsoon rain test. So the car uh, is basically tested for any kind of water leakage. Um, and you discover lots of stuff there. If anybody did anything wrong, that's usually where you see it. Yeah. And we have a light tunnel uh, to see any defects on the paint. And after that, the car gets protected very detailed. So every piece of the car gets protected with foil. And then it goes to road testing. And that mm -hmm. can be a few days of road testing. Yeah. And then people, like if there is some squeak or rattle, you redo it. And then um, they, uh, it comes for repairs here, for a rework. Test it again until it's done and then it goes to the customer. So we're standing beside your dyno at the moment. Yeah, I think we can open that just a second. Although 3,000 horsepower right now sounds like a lot, but who knows what the future has in store, hey? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, wow. at, at the moment when we were building this, there was no indication of Bugatti yet, so uh, there is no exhaust, but we can run uh, 3,000 horsepower here. So, but we'll have to add an exhaust system also for <laughs> some cars in the future. Well, actually, uh, we will only produce prototypes of future Bugattis in Croatia. Okay. The customer cars will be still produced in Molsheim yep. in the historic 113 yeah. uh, year location. As per tradition. Now I recognize this spot because this is where Nico's car was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nico picked up his car here. Yes. <laughs> and there is a car lurking under the cover just there also. That's a customer car, but it's up to the customers to show their cars, not to us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is the other part of the business where we produce the batteries for other car companies. So here we produce a battery for Hyundai, a future Hyundai car. Um, here on the right side is maybe something interesting for your viewers. It's the assembly line for the Aston Martin Valkyrie battery. Okay. So that's a Valkyrie battery. Actually, it's beautiful. That's how we ship it with this nice cover, uh, with this nice box with some additional stuff. Do you know what? Even that, you, you said it's beautiful. It actually is. Yeah. The way it's presented, the way, the way you look at this, it, it's not just... You could think that because it's going to be hidden away, it can be left ugly, it can look untidy. While being as lightweight and compact as possible, it's also the presentation it's important. of it. It's important. And maybe a world exclusive is a little bit how it looks like inside. It's actually a flooded, uh, cooled battery pack. It's very much Formula One. It's really Formula mm -hmm. One. I mean, the Valkyrie is something I definitely want to have. It's such a crazy car. It's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, this is basically Formula One stuff. Clever. Um, and the Koenigsegg uh, battery was produced in our previous facility. That's pretty much done. Here are some projects I cannot talk about yet, but you can maybe have a peek on the left-hand side. <laughs> left, left, not right. Is this kind of like, well, we go by, there's something happening here. So this is a very big production line. So this is our first high volume production. So it's a battery that we are developing for the last three years. And now uh, we can see here some robots and uh, pr assembly parts that uh, will chunk out 50,000 batteries per year. 
Whoa, okay. So we are going from you know, a few hundred units per year that we are doing for other um, car companies like for Aston and so on, Pininfarina, whatever, to really high volume production. And that's a huge step for a company. Yep. Uh, this is one project here, but then we have a lot more like that in uh, the campus coming, where we have a lot more space. And actually, so campus is like seven times bigger than this location. And it's already completely maxed out with projects. Uh, so we are already thinking about building campus too. <laughs> yeah. Your rate of growth is unlike anything that this industry, I think, has known. Yeah, so th this is an interesting part where we build. So these are like bunkers. So we have these big doors with four bunkers here yeah. uh, where we build uh, big batteries, prototypes. And if something goes wrong, they are shut off the rest of the of the building so that the fire cannot spread. Yep. That's the kind of stuff that can happen. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe we can show a bit here. This is the uh, Nevera battery module. So in Nevera, we are using 21700 cells. Uh, wow. You have big modules and small modules. So these are the modules that are inside the tunnel, for example, under mm -hmm. your feet. This is the module sitting behind you. Uh, so for example, all of this stuff is being machined in our other location. Um, cells are, of course, not made by us. They are from suppliers. And we use all kinds of different cells. And here, just an example of a part, how that looks like. So this is the holder, which is like super light. And you cannot injection mold it because the wall between the cells is less than a millimeter. And if you injection mold, you need to have some kind of angle to, to take the tool out. And so we need to machine every of these holes. And it was so difficult to find a way to machine that there can be less than one millimeter of material between them. And a special material that has uh, glass spheres inside so that if a fire breaks out in one of the cells, that the neighboring cells are protected. So it has to be super light, but also thermally protecting for in case of a fire. Um, so some of the challenges of doing that. And then actually what you don't see on these modules, this is just a bare module. We have then uh, connection plates uh, to connect the cells and cooling plates. So it's cooled with uh, cooling plates that have water flowing through them. Uh, so it's not flooded cooling. So it's completely different than the Aston Martin battery that we make. So there's so many different types of batteries that you can see here for many different car companies. And I can show you the Nevera stuff because it's ours, but what we do for others, not so much. Uh, maybe we can see how a battery of the Nevera actually looks like assembled. Let's check here. Yes, we can. Oh, here we can see actually assembled module. So this is the module with the cooling plate. So you can see here it has, so water is flowing through these chambers and you can see that every, uh, above every cell there is a hole. Why? Because if there is a thermal runaway, you have to dissipate the, the gases that are coming out of mm -hmm. a cell. Mm -hmm. yep. So otherwise they would penetrate the coolant and the coolant would run into the module, which you want to avoid. So the, the, in case, let's say, this cell catches fire, the venting, the, the ventilation would go out, and then we channel it outside of the battery that it doesn't spread inside the module and through other modules. That's mm -hmm. very tricky to do. Here we can see actually a fully assembled, or maybe almost fully assembled Nevera uh, battery pack. So we have the rear modules. So your seat is here. The, the passenger seat is here. The driver's seat is here, only left-hand drive. Um, and uh, yeah, your feet are here on these modules. And this is the most powerful battery on the market. So 1.4 megawatts of discharge, 120 kilowatt hours of energy. So actually you have a small car, a hypercar that has basically more energy than any other car on the market, except I think the Rivian now has uh, something like 140 or something like that. Um, and it can recharge with 500 kilowatts. So fast charging with 500 kilowatts. That's also the highest power recharge. Uh, so very difficult battery also because it's so, it's much easier to make a battery that's just a skateboard on the floor, yeah. like a Tesla. Because all the modules can be the same. Cooling distribution is simple. Here, for example, you can see because of the different pressures and different lengths and different heights, you have all of these different diameters of coolant systems and coolant pipes to distribute the pressure drops so that every module gets the equal amount of coolant. Mm -hmm. That's super difficult to do. And then all of this high voltage routing. And here on top comes the power distribution system that you saw 
being produced in the other location, uh, in the other assembly station. And then uh, comes the cover, it gets tested and into a nevera. It's quite interesting to see the shape, as you just said, compared to a skateboard style design. Because obviously you're also working for driving dynamics and performance being critical because it's a hypercar. It's not just about, I guess, being easy to, to do everything the easy way. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always a compromise. And in my position, I have to be often the policeman between the design, for example, and engineering or the battery development and the chassis development or whatever, because everybody's fighting for their stuff. Everybody wants more space, uh, more weight, more, uh, I don't know, uh, package. So, for example, here, you know, the, for the battery team, it would be much easier to just make a flat battery, put it, see it on top, and that's it. But then the roof, then your seat raises, your H point raises, your roof raises, and it doesn't look like a hypercar anymore. That would be the easy way to do it. But we decided not to do it in that way. And that's the kind of compromise you have everywhere. And maybe just one thing to show you, again, super small volume production, but, you know, that's what I love, uh, making things visual and simple. So you can put all of these things in the warehouse into a box and bring them here. But uh, in this way, you see actually what you put in the battery. If there is a piece left here, you know that you missed a piece. Or the guy in the warehouse knows, if he didn't populate everything, that you forgot one part. Yeah. Because in the end, it's the stupid things. You, you would not believe how, you know, making such a car is sophisticated complex stuff but you fail also on the very simple things yep. like the warehouse guy picking the right things bringing them here and if he didn't put in the part that he tells somebody you know that he didn't put in the part <laughs> you know that creates such a mess yeah. you wouldn't believe so such things are also very important and then in these bunkers we have all of these you know ventilation systems and uh, sprinkler systems if something goes wrong that um, it can uh, yeah. extinguish it and it doesn't spread to the rest of the building and every of these areas has a door to get outside that you can pull it out. Everything is on wheels in case something is wrong. We learn it the hard way. Things like this happen. I can believe it. Here we are passing with, uh, next to some fun stuff. You know what this is? An M3? No, that's my original BMW E30. The one I started a company with. Right. Yeah, I turned it into electric 13, 14 years ago. Of course, uh, that's the, I mean, I wasn't far off by guessing an M3. It's a, it's <laughs> yeah, almost. It was actually, uh, people think it was an M3, but it was a 323. Okay. 1984. Uh, some people are wondering how has then the big lights, because I didn't like the you know, pre-facelift E30 lights, so yeah. I cut it off and put uh, the newer lights on. But anyways, why the car is here? Because um, one of our engineers crashed it like eight years ago. And every year I make a list of things I want to do for that year. And on top of the list is I want to get this car into shape again. And I never do it because there's always something more important. So now I said, I really want to do it. So I put it here so I see it every day. It's happening. So I have some pressure to, yes. to actually do it. <laughs> if it's right in front of you, you have to make sure it gets yeah. done. So here we are in our paint shop. Uh, so all the parts are being painted here, visible carbon and uh, also the you know, different paints. So the parts after the zone zero, they come here. So like the front bonnet, the bumper, the rear bonnet. And here we have preparation boots. So we see here um, rear bonnet for the door. Actually, I think it's for the same car, for the black one. Mm -hmm. So some parts are already done, some are not. Monocoque being painted. And so this is all preparation. And then in the end, we have two paint boots where the actual painting happens. Also something I was a bit surprised about that actually you need a lot more preparation space to grind all of that stuff, mm -hmm. especially for carbon, where you have lots of stuff you have to like, you know, this part has to be partially visible carbon and then vis uh, partially like uh, painted and, you know, stripes and stuff like that. So that's a lot of preparation. It's, actually, it takes a lot of time. It's a very manual process. Exactly. Painting actually is not that uh, part of the process. Preparation is a lot more important. So yeah. Here all the customization happens, and after that the parts go on the car, and the cars are going out to the customers. And down those two lines, obviously the Navira line, when all the panels are back on, it goes through the testing processes. Yeah. The other side it leaves as a rolling chassis. Exactly, without this. So this is the part of the process that happens somewhere else at the customer side for the rolling chassis. What do you call this area? Uh, we call it Lighthouse. Uh, so this was actually the greenhouse of the shopping center. They were selling like uh, plants here. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, so crazy. And actually, it's right on the main street here in Zagreb. So yeah. people are passing through here and seeing all the cars. And the intention for this is to uh, keep like cars that need to go to customers, but mm -hmm. they didn't pick them up. Okay. You would say it sounds crazy. Like, why would somebody order a two million euro car and not pick it up? But actually, like at Bugatti, we have sometimes like dozens of cars waiting yeah. for their customers to like you know send the car to, to be the picked up. The people who are lucky to buy these cars are busy people. Yeah, busy, busy people, people or, with busy lives. You know, forget whatever. And this is where the event was today. Hence the the packing up at the moment. Yeah, they're but, packing up. But we go all the way through from very early. So we are keeping here for now some of the prototypes. And usually my personal cars are right here, but we had to remove them because of the event. So. Uh, we actually made uh, 17 prototypes of the Nevera before we delivered the first customer car. 17 cars. And some of them are here. So this was the very first one. This was not a real car. This is just an aerodynamic uh, wind tunnel test bug. So wow. we did like millions of simulations in, uh, in the computer. And then, you know, this is just to verify like your rough assumptions. Uh, is it working in, a, in yeah. a big wind tunnel? And you can easily remove parts. Like you come to the wind tunnel with five different wings. You test different wings and, you know, see how it behaves. Then we started to produce uh, running cars, and you saw one of them in the entrance. Uh, the two others are actually, uh, yeah, the remains of them, the bones are here. And I think you actually have a piece of one of these cars yeah. <laughs> uh, from the crash test. So we had a give giveaway and you got- Yeah, one of the, the, one of the uh, sections of the door handle, yeah. door, door control section, which is from one of these. Yeah. That's so, quite fun. You know, these were actual cars, full cars that were crashed multiple times. And of course, we don't want to crash too many cars, so we try to make it super efficient. So you crash one car first at a very low speed in the front, then you repair the parts that are broken, then a higher speed in the front, then you replace the crash structure, then you do another uh, front crash, and until you do the high speed crash, let's say this one was done just on left-hand side, so let's say a 40% offset, 64 kilometers mm -hmm. per hour, and that's the only one that breaks the monocoque. Yep. So most of our crash tests, the monocoque stays intact, just the aluminum crash structure gets damaged. But then the high speed ones, the monocoque breaks, which is like, that's a really high speed crash. Then, and then we use the monocoque for maybe a side impact, like this one, then perhaps a rear crash, um, and then maybe a roof crash. So we can see that here also the roof broke. So I think this was also used for a roof crash test. It sounds so painful, but you have to do it for homologation. So with Nevera, I wanted to do it properly. And uh, it cost a lot a lot of time, a lot of effort. And you know, it's crazy how at the same time as the pro pro project was developing, the company developed. At the same time we raised like, you know, almost a billion euros of money, it went from 200 people when we started with Nevera to more than one and a half thousand when we started to produce the car. Uh, we switched locations several times. So the Nevera was produced now in three factories. And when we moved to the campus, it will be the fourth factory the car is being yeah. produced in. So we learned so much along the way but we wanted to do it really on a very high level. And that's what you also feel when you sit in the car. It doesn't feel like a small company project. It feels mm. like a proper developed car. And that was very important for me. So we had three generations of prototypes, experimental prototypes, validation prototypes, pre-series cars. So these were experimental prototypes. Here we see validation prototypes. And uh, these cars were usually used on all different tracks around Europe, so in Nardo, in, um, uh, in Croatian, different tracks, uh, in uh, Germany, different test facilities, I don't know, uh, for abuse testing, for track testing. And then after their first life, they were used for crash testing. Some of them even for customer events and for journalist test drives and then crashed. So fully functional, beautifully finished cars <laughs> had to be crashed sometimes, but that's part of it. I love that you keep them and allow them to be seen though, because it would be easy to hide that away but we're looking at a significant part of the journey of oh. Navera here this is we, we are tech guys we are you know engineers at heart we we want you know that's that's part of the engineering porn and we gave some of them away actually to universities and now when we will be done with the project i'm thinking what to do with some of them so i guess we'll make some kind of competition so that uh, uh, so that universities or like enthusiasts can get some of that because i don't know what to do with them um, and there's many more, this is just part of them. And there's, we will have five cars uh, uh, remaining alive after this whole thing. So yeah. five prototypes will remain alive and we will not need all of them as well. So let's, let's see what we'll do with them. I have some ideas what to do with them <laughs> for next, for upgrades, but also, you know, it's always a balance between for next car, how much of the previous do you keep? With this one, we didn't keep anything. We started completely from scratch, yeah. but you know, at some point, 
uh, it might make sense to start with what you have and then improve rather than starting every time from scratch. Well, I must say for the next Bugatti, we start again absolutely from scratch. Not one bolt from the Nevera or the, or the Chiron is actually in the next Bugatti. So that's well, difficult for me actually to say, hmm, this was good enough to use it for the next project. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm guessing while we're standing here, that's probably you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, can we have a quick talk? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I always wanted to have an E30 M3. People yeah. thought that my E30 was an M3, but no, it wasn't. So finally, like, uh, you know, I, I put everything in the company. I was working day and night and putting the company always first, not myself. And after, uh, after like 10 years of building the company, when it was like over a thousand people, I decided to sell like a small part of my share of the company and made some nice money and all of that is going into cars. Yeah. So the first, first car I bought was the E30 M3 and it's an Evo, uh, Evo 3. So the best out there, I would say, amazing. But I must say, to be honest, it was always such a dream for me. And then driving it, it's nice, but you can really see that any modern car, like a, you know, the basic one series BMW is actually faster than this today. Yeah. So well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. it, it's it, beautiful but not fast yeah. it's a passion right it's a passion yeah well what a stunning place um i mean what an amazing opportunity um to come and have a look around today thank you very much for thank you for making this possible to see through the different stages of the, the current facility and I, I hope we're going to be able to catch up again when the Next campus time the is campus. ready yes which absolutely. will be super exciting as well wonderful thank you ever so much Thank you, Tim. We come to an end then of the tour of the Rimats assembly hall with Mate, but also the end of Supercar Owner's Circle here in Croatia. It is time now to load up my Zenvo TSRS. It will actually be returning to Zenvo's base in Prastu in Denmark. They're going to give it a full shakedown, given that I have now driven, well, effectively the first 1,000 kilometers with this monster. They'll go through the entire thing, part of the shakedown, you could say, in some ways. It needs a bit of an oil change to make sure it is now ready to give full power and perhaps to look into the amount of flames that it makes and dial down the map a little bit. We'll see about that, but what an amazing time it has been, both on Supercar Owners Circle with all of the team, a huge, huge thanks for that, but also here with Mate to spare his time to show us around and to see more of the assembly line and different parts of the development and process. What a special opportunity, a huge, huge, huge thanks. And of course, to you guys for watching. I cannot thank you enough for your support, but that is the end of this little trip for the time being, and I will see you again very soon. Cheers!